Last year when we did this, we we actually tried to play the the theme music and stuff, and that was just really weird. We so, don't have theme music anymore. So what this means officially is that um, we kind of don't know when the show has begun. It started. Has it begun? Okay, so welcome to the Story Studio Podcast. <laughs> Uh, so as you guys may know, if you've listened to the most recent episode, we don't e actually even have an intro anymore. Um, so that just, I mean, it's actually kind of perfect because then we don't even have to worry about the fact that we didn't play it being an omission. Um, yeah, Danielle sent us an email that said the one without the intro. <laughs> and it was very kind. Thank you, Danielle. So what did we decide we were going to talk about again? Um, I actually think... On that run for the chicken fingers? Yeah, so on the way back from chicken fingers, we were trying to decide what After we, we almost doing. died? Yeah. That, that actually he happened. cannot drive. Stay tuned I, for I, I have, Look, I've had three accidents this in my his entire fault, life, though. and they were all the first month after I got my license. I've been really good for 24 years. And your mother let you keep driving? Um, Does she have a life insurance policy? Well, she did, but I think they just mm -hmm. wanted me to keep making flower deliveries. I, I honestly... <laughs> Um, so yeah, w w on the way back, we were talking about what the best thing that we could talk about. And I think one thing we'd love is audience participation. If you guys got something to say, yell it, have fun. Um, but other than that, we wanted to talk about what the last year has been like. And uh, it was really awesome to come in and hear how many of what your years have been like. So I, th I think it's an even more fitting topic than I expected. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, I don't like this. Because all you guys look in, it's weird. It is kind of weird. <laughs> I think last year was, why was it different last year? I think maybe I was drinking. You, I think you were drinking. <laughs> that might have been it. We did have a stage. Okay. So um, let's start by, as with everything, by talking about Dave. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody noticed, but Dave has uh, gotten smaller this year. <laughs> and. If you guys want to hear the story of uh, Dave ranting on his travel, there isn't one, which is, well, I know, really disappointing. Well, no, hold on. He'll manufacture one. No, no, there was you know, one. It was just on the second day, not the It was the first. on the second day. But, but OK, so guys, we recorded. Um, we're going to go back to doing these live, by the way. Like, not these, because this is obviously live, but like recording the, the story no, studio. No, every podcast. Friday, well, you meet us in here. You can meet us in here. <laughs> it's a live show. Uh, but as we've been doing it, we've been recording just you know, recording and then putting them out later. And so, so it, because we're still kind of figuring out where we are and fulfilling some other obligations, we've been doing two, uh, two every other week. It just seemed to make the most sense. So we're ready to record on Friday. We're a few hours beforehand. And, and Sean goes uh, on our, our partner's channel where all three of us are on our Slack. And, and Sean goes, hey, Dave, are you joining us for the podcast or are you traveling? And I'm like, okay, that doesn't make any sense to me at all because Dave is coming in as far as I can, I thought, on Sunday. Um, because I'd asked a bunch of times, and I think he gave me some answers one way or the other, but he was trying to figure out, well... Oh, I told you, you just don't remember. I got to rent a car, and this happened, and blah, blah, and it was much grumbling. You and never so, get a one-sentence answer with Dave. It's all lowercase no. and angrily tied well, to Well, the, the curse words are uppercase. So what I didn't, what I didn't, what I didn't understand was that um, if Dave was indeed traveling, it meant that he had traveled for a half a day without us hearing about a it. A full day. <laughs> I'm trying to unspool a dramatic story here. Okay. Don't interrupt me. I'll just be quiet. So it meant that he had been traveling for half a day and we hadn't heard anything, which is really, really ridiculous. And, and of course, then I'm looking back and saying we haven't heard anything for the preceding weeks and months. And, and <laughs> last year we were hearing about this. Who remembers for, last year Dave's, um, well, anxiety is a kind way of putting it. Do you remember that last year <laughs> where he almost didn't come and he called us out a few days before and he goes, I, I can't come. I can't come. And we're like, dude, people paid. <laughs> You're going to come. And then he came. But it was like 90s annex or something, a whole bottle. And he was he was very ranty. And so I wasn't making these connections. It just it just didn't vibe. And then uh, I guess, you know, he was he was on the road. And so Sean and I were having this discussion. He's like, dude, I think he's driving. And I said, OK, well, so when is he coming in? He finally responded. He said, I'm getting in around 6 p.m. And I, what? 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. today? And now, if you know, and if you can do the math here, it's a two-day drive, which meant he had been driving for a day and a half. And so for this Dave, this particular Dave that we have up on stage... As opposed to the other ones. ...to have driven for... There's a few Daves in the audience. Um, can we see a show of hands of Daves in the audience? <laughs> wow. Thank you. There's at least... <laughs> Dave Lacani's here somewhere, too. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, that in all seriousness, that is a big change because that's absurd. 
for Dave to travel. Remember for a... last year when Dame and Courtney did the live reading of Dave Slacks? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right, that was pretty epic. And if anybody remembers what he called Louisiana, a shithole? <laughs> no, 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 it was much no, more was, sexual. Yeah, right. And it was also a paragraph. But <laughs> if anybody remembers that, that's what we normally get when Dave travels. The fact that he traveled with Grace is just, I don't even Grace. know. Grace. Well, I mean, it's Dave's version of Grace. When he yeah. finally got on, he said, he said, yes, I'm, I'm driving. I'm entering Louisiana. There were a few expletives because he felt that he needed to because he was in front of an audience. And, but that was it. And so for, I guess I'd like to frame this episode about, I mean, this the theme of this is going pro. And I know that a lot of us are already pros. And I certainly would consider us pros by whatever, whatever that means. But in this past year, Hi. Sterling and Stone took the, it took, we took fiction a lot more seriously. We kind of turned pro above wherever we were. It was like another level of turning pro. And so since that's what we're going to be talking about, everything, all the sessions are to some degree about what it takes to go from, well, you're kind of dabbling, and now the Amazon marketplace and the other marketplaces, and, and, and I mean, Amazon in particular is kind of a, a fucker. So talk to the other folk, folks here who aren't representing Amazon because they're kind of more awesome. But the point is, <laughs> it is getting increasingly difficult to get noticed, and there is a lot of, of, of churn out there, and so you need to outsmart all of this. And so that's, that's what we're looking at through this entire summit is how to outsmart, how to grow up, how to be another level of pro. Because we want everybody in this room and in the rooms tomorrow to have an advantage over the average person who didn't really stop to think to out, outwit any algorithms and just said, I'm just going to dump my books in. So that's kind of think how we kind of wanted to frame this is let's talk about how we're all just turning another level of pro. Yeah. So and if anybody up here wants to come up and, and actually tell a story about their year, if they've had something that's worth sharing, by all means, do. Um, but but our, our new year has always started right after the summit. So this is the close of a year for us, and last year was the a, a brand new version. So who who in here has heard the story of our family dinner last year? Okay, just Dave. Marie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Dave, do you want to tell the story? Because I know we've told it, but like it actually happened to you, and we always own this story. <laughs> so do you want to tell the story? Sure. Okay. Uh, so last uh, every year we we meet at a um, secret location. Um, to, to Jack just, Allen's on 360. <laughs> well, now everyone's going to be there. What the fuck, you idiot? <laughs> okay, we'll have to find a new location. Do you know that hipster Canes. who owns that place thought that people would want a book about him? The guy's such an asshole. <laughs> He's such an asshole. So, um, so last year we go to dinner, and, and Sean begins by uh, just an assault on me. Like wait, 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 wait. <laughs> That's not the story. Do he I need to tell the story? Yeah, I think you do need to tell the story. He I composed. Uh, I just remember he, There was a deep punched. breath, <laughs> and it basically foretold of things that Dave and I didn't know were coming that he had very carefully <laughs> thought out. Yeah, th this is like a dinner we're looking forward to. We're going to relax and unwind. And The yeah. hard part is over. <laughs> And Sean's basically like, yeah, you guys are fucking up and you need to improve right, Dave, every no, area no, no. of your life. Right. Otherwise, we're getting divorced. I'm telling the story. I'm telling the story. <laughs> Hello. All right. So so it was family dinner and it's supposed to be our celebration. And we were, you know, saying goodbye to, you know, last year's summit and saying goodbye to Dave because he was going to drive home the next day um, and probably very ranty. And this was the worst trip that I've had with Dave from the time that he got here. Because I've known Dave for 10 years. We worked together for 10 years. That's a long time, right? Especially in online years. It just is. And especially with me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> I've been married to Cindy for 20 years, and it seems like half an hour compared to Dave. <laughs> like, it, it's different. And so, like, that's, that's, that's fine. I'm used to our rhythm. But, but he had so much anxiety before coming last year. And it was, it, was, it was pretty bad. And we really had to talk him off the ledge. And then when he got here, we thought everything will be OK because he's finally here. It wasn't OK. Like, I mean, he was just grouchy. And it was, it was There were some really angry moments. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. it, was, it was bad. And, and, but it was, it was more whole than that. It was. And I, and I realized that we got to dinner. And there was just a couple of things like, look, we are a family. And family is not always just about laughing and celebrating. And my family's never laughed yeah. once. <laughs> so, I, I I think they laugh when you leave. <laughs> the, the, Did you see that guy? <laughs> so all the O's there? Are you kidding me? Do you guys not know Dave? What this, the hell? This happens at home every week, and we just don't hear it. 
<laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, like, just need a show of hands. How many people, like, silently feel sorry for Dave every week? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. There you go. So, <laughs> so yeah, the, the, the actual... Um, this is way easier with alcohol, just for future reference. <laughs> um, no, I don't drink during February, which is really stupid, and I, I don't want to explain it again. But yeah, anyway, um, uh, Dave was very just agitated, and, and I felt like this is the time we have to talk about it, because I don't want to have these conversations over the phone or on Slack or in email. There's enough digital bullshit right now. Being able to talk to your partner you know, Dave is one of my best friends. He is my partner. We're great collaborators. But there's a few things that, you know, we needed to fix. And being able to talk as a family at our family dinner was the time to take care of that. It, I, I wasn't willing to let him go drive across the country and start the cycle again. Because the last time we had had this conversation was a year before in 2017. And Dave said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to get my house on the market. I'm going to lose a bunch of weight. I'm going to start writing. I'm going to get my shit together. And it had been a year. And not only had none of those things happened, it was actually worse than it used to be. And I looked at what our life together had been. Wow, I'm really making it sound like we're married. But <laughs> what, what our life together... But the sex was always good. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, what our life together had been like so far, and it, it really had been. Like, if I'm looking at who Dave was when we first started, and then in the Yesterday's Gone <clears throat> era... There was an excitement there and, uh, you know, a verve that he had that he... It verve? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember, like, Bittersweet Me? Symphony? Me? Don't yeah. you remember your nickname, the verve type? <laughs> <laughs> so there was... I was only a freshman, though. There was this, like... <laughs> Some of you got that. <laughs> So there was this like downward trajectory and I couldn't get Dave excited about creating fiction. Everything seemed like a job and everything like there was all this wonderful opportunity opening up for us. But it, it always hit Dave like a chore or like another obligation. And I said, look, dude, I, I love you. I just want to know what's going to happen because I think you're at a crisis point in your life right now and you need to make a decision. Either double down with us and realize that we're creating amazing things and we're including you in those things and that means you have a responsibility to us and you have work to do or just say, you know what, I, I want to back out. I don't really want a part of the company because it's too much. And, and Johnny was like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> and then... And then it's like, why and, did Daddy guys, just punch Mommy in the no, no, face? No. Okay, so let me let me let me add this. Let me add let me add some some color to this scene because because Sean is adequately describing it. But you know, as we know, on, on the second draft, sometimes you have to go through and add some description in the five senses. So when Sean gets serious, he does this. <laughs> Only is talking, and he's very like. <laughs> wow, that's and, intimidating. Yeah, it is. It, it is intimidating because he's just like, and and I'm, I mean, I'm saying it in in a comical like a way, boss. but but it's very. He's he's like he's like, like dialed in. He's like very serious and very. I mean, it's very sincere, is what it is. And Dave across from him is doing this, <laughs> and I'm like, one of two things is going on right now. Either Dave is absorbing all of this and is really internalizing it, or Dave is going to fucking kill us. <laughs> And they're never going to know they're going to find our bodies in a shallow grave. He's like, because he's just really stoic. There's no smiling. There's no breaking of eye contact. It was my decoy emotion. And because he wasn't emotion. saying anything. I, right. So I like, pretend, pretend that you're Sean. This is Dave. And it went on and on and on. And I'm oh, kind of cowering over here. And then I, I, like, got a, I got some shrapnel on that, too. And so it was a really fun dinner. <laughs> By the way, you know, I was really looking forward to eating and like my appetite. We was all going were. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, well the, the point was like sometimes you have to have those conversations. It's really important. You can't let those things go unsaid. And, you know, we actually just talked about this over the last two days. We've had, you know, the, the last our last stone table session. And one of the things we were talking about is the importance of collaboration. And there's really only one thing you need to really know and internalize, and that's candor and, um, and grace. You know, you have to be really direct and really honest in any kind of collaborative relationship, what you need and what you expect and what you're willing to give and give more. And I feel like 
for a long time in my relationship with Dave, I was giving more substantially more than I was getting. And I was just saying, look, dude, like I don't, we don't need to even it. I just want to know that you're, you're playing with me. And, and, and the reason I felt like we needed to have that conversation is because normally it's, I feel like it's my job to save Dave and it's not my job. And I realized, dude, that's not my job. And I'm actually making things worse. That's why I had to have that conversation because I knew that by always rescuing him, I, I wasn't, he couldn't rescue himself because he knew I was always going to do it. So I said, dude, you have to be in charge of yourself. You have to make changes. And to Dave's uh, beautiful credit, first of all, when the dinner ended, when, when it was finally his turn to talk, anyone want to guess what he said? Thank you. Yeah, that's right. He said thank you. This is just that's like weird. the plot I, I of meant a romantic to say comedy. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said thank you, and then we walked out. Um, you know, Johnny left. I think hand Johnny, in hand. Yeah. <laughs> the music came up. Johnny was definitely. Dave started running for love in slow motion. <laughs> Wait. No, that's just how fast I run. <laughs> <laughs> so Johnny like couldn't get home fast enough, and then he left. And then you know I'm walking Dave out to his car, and and you know it, it was it was a wonderful moment like we kissed and <laughs> <laughs> there I was mean, some light fondling in all seriousness dave was very appreciative and he said i i said how are you feeling and tell me if i'm getting any of this wrong because I, you I, think i remember a year ago well i don't either <laughs> but but I, I remember dave saying well now i can say anything so <laughs> i remember dave saying you can have all my money when I die. Right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to neglect the pineapple farm anymore. I mean, he made a lot of promises. So the, he really did say, thank you. I'm just, I'm processing right now. I appreciate you being direct with me. I have a long drive. I have two days to think. And um, That was and, a fun drive, by the yeah. way. <laughs> but to Dave's credit, you know, in 10 years, I've never had a better Dave for a year. Um, he's lost a lot of weight. His drive is back. Um, his creativity is is peaking. Um, and so I, I think that those things are necessary. Those conversations are uncomfortable. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm lucky that I'm married to somebody who is so zen. And she always says... He's not that zen. <laughs> <laughs> and she says things all the time like, it's everything's temporary. And, you know, being married for 22 years, that kind of steeps in. And, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I can feel that after a while. But I think that you have to get, you have to be uncomfortable to be comfortable. You have to, anytime you're changing some mild discomfort for a permanent change, it's a really good, it's a, it's a good exchange. <clears throat> Take it. And, and that's it. I knew that dinner was going to be terrible. And I knew it was going to be extra terrible because I was ambushing them. You know, like that sucked. But it also wouldn't have been like, hey, guys, we're going to go to dinner and have a serious conversation, right? Like that wouldn't have gone over. I needed to wait and sit down and then say, it's, it's family dinner, and this is what we have to do. And I'm really glad we did it. And I think that Dave's had a great year. I think we've all had a great year. And I'm really excited for the next couple of days because we're going to get to talk about a lot of stuff that we haven't been able to really talk about. And we've had an awesome year, and I think we kind of want to break some of that down now. Do you remember that time we had an opening night mixer and forgot <laughs> to thank the sponsors who made it all possible? Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. So uh, in, in all seriousness... I feel like a total dick, which is pretty cool. Um, I do want to thank Written Word Media. That's Farrell over there. And uh, the Story Shop guys, who are going to have some really cool stuff to show you. So I did want to include that just because I forgot and I'm an, I'm an asshole. But it, how does that bring that around? You could have just pretended like you didn't forget and roll right into it right now. Before we get really started, let's thank our sponsor. No, because I'm being real. I'm being real. <laughs> but bring that around. So, so that's, that story that you told... How is that relevant to going pro in the past year? How is that relevant to what's going on and for artists moving forward in this next phase? Well, I think you have to take your um, work and your art seriously. And I think there's a lot of people, a lot of writers especially. Are, and, and again, I, I don't think that's true in this room. I do think it's true industry-wide. I think a lot of writers like to dream. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a writer someday. I'm going to write my book someday. I'm going to do this someday. They all have the someday. And you have to be responsible for your own fate, your own career. There's really no question about that. You have to dig your heels in and decide what you're going to do. Um, you know, determine whether you're willing to pay the tax, or whatever that is, to get that thing that you want. And then either pay it or don't. But don't 
half pay it and then bitch that the algorithms are changing. So I'm curious. I'd like to do an informal poll here. I don't know if any of you guys are going to want to get in on this, but I'd like to see anybody who who seriously thought, like, maybe I can't come this year specifically because sales are down, because times are tough, because it's hard to kind of justify this. Does anyone anyone feel that way? Did anyone feel that way this year? A few of you. Okay, it should have been much more. You're, I, my point is now totally <laughs> moot. But... Or, yeah, I, I, a lot of them are here. That's actually a really good point and totally what I was trying to say from the beginning is that Do you, you guys all got it together. I was expecting more hands because, honestly, um, it's felt that way a little bit, you, you know, to us as well. And we have a lot going on. And it, it is The marketplace is changing. And I think that at the beginning, it was very easy to just kind of push publish and, honestly, write, publish, repeat. You can just put books out and things will work. And that was always something that, that, would, that would happen. But... Um, these days, it is requiring that more pro attitude. It is requiring some kind of serious discussions with yourself. How serious am I about this? Um, it's not something that I can just dash things off anymore. And if you are able to just continue to dash things off, then awesome. I really, uh, that's great for you. But I think more and he more people. He also hates you a little. I do hate you a little bit. I think more and more people are finding that you need to. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now is, well, how can we outsmart algorithms? How can we outsmart the random things that seem to happen in the marketplace as more and more people are getting into this? And we really want to stand out. And so how do you stand out as an author? Um, I, I would like, is there anybody who, who has any any stories of, of significant change in the year? I don't know if anybody's extroverted enough to, brave brave enough to raise their arm in a room like this. Okay. Oh, perfect. Oh. Yes, yes. So I'm Jamie Crumpton. I write as Jamie Albright. And I'm really only telling this because <clears throat> it started here so uh, four years ago. But I um, came to Smarter Artist the first year. I returned all my Christmas presents, and that's how I paid for my ticket to come to Smart Artist that year because I wasn't publishing. And, I mean, I, didn't, I had a book, but and I was going to put it out right after Smarter Artist, but... Uh, Sean and Julia Kent advised me not to do that, and so I waited a year. I tried to get three done. I didn't. But um, I learned indie publishing in that year. I listened to hours of podcasts. I read every book I could. I asked questions that made me look stupid, but I wanted to know how to do it. So I published my first book in April of 2017, and six months later, I pushed put out the book, next book. I don't publish fast. A year later, I put out the next book, but in December, I became a six-figure author. So, <laughs> This is, guys, it all started here. So if they hadn't... Just in time for Christmas, too. I know. I know my family was... Well, not really, because we didn't get it until... Uh. Yeah. <laughs> it was a late Christmas. So. so was there... No, no, don't go anywhere yet. So, <laughs> so what... In the past year, do, have you noticed... Have you have you gone more pro? Have you have you oh, yeah. have there been any hats that you've kind of had to put on in a different way as before and really reassess everything you're doing? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I started like the book came out April 11th. On April 13th, I started running AMS ads at two dollars a day. I mean, y'all, I sold plasma to pay for my edits the for, for the first book. Like I had no money, but I. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're clapping about your blood. But. It was good blood. Yay, you had yeah. no money. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but I, and so I started running ads like two days later, $2 a day, and literally was thinking, okay, it's the 13th, there are 30 days in April. If I spend $2 a day or if I spend $5 a day, how much is that going to be? And, you know, can I afford that? And when we got to the end of the month, though, I'd spent $130, and, my hus and I had to tell my husband that I had taken it from, you know, the household income. And, um, but I had made $1,600 off that $130. So he was, uh, he was on board. But <laughs> <laughs> so when the second book came out last November, um, my income... Um, I had more money to advertise with, and so I started advertising. And from November of 2017 to, well, really September of this past year, um, I made $5,000 a month, every month. And it's because I advertised 
strategically and heavily, and I took every penny that I could take from my business and put it back in the business of advertising. And I, I made some mistakes, but thankfully they weren't huge ones. But uh, all the mistakes I made, I fixed them, and I got help, and I asked, you know, I asked for help. And you look really stupid sometimes when you ask for help, but it didn't matter. I mean, I needed, I wanted to make a living with this, and I, uh, a month after the second book came out, I quit my job, and so I've been writing full time for a year. So, anyway, but yeah, so that's it. I just really strategic marketing, really strategic, um, like. Newsletter swaps, if I did those, I only did them with romantic comedy or contemporary, like contemporary romance readers, I mean writers, just really making decisions that each, where each step would take me one step further. So doing the work, but also exhibiting a lot of patience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really, yeah, because you, I've had to I've had to come to the point where I think, you know, yes, because I'm also like I love this community and this is my community, but I'm also in kind of the romance community where I have friends who are making just a, oh, I was gonna say a bad word a shit ton of money and um, there's no cursing okay. on this fucking okay. show no, no. <laughs> and so because of that it's easy to get kind of get caught up in this I got to do more I got to do more well. You know, I'm dealing with the budget here, and I can't go over that budget. And so I, it's been, I've been able to make peace with the fact that, yes, while I would like to be, you know, making $20,000 a month, I'm okay with where I'm at because I'm, I'm making more than $5,000. let us just put it that way. And I'm okay taking, making incremental steps because I don't have to have it all today because this is for a long time. You're also not going to burn out. No. Right? No. Who's, who does not want to write a book every three weeks or whatever? Right? I mean, <laughs> and, okay, who Look here? Look at how Sean got a response to his <laughs> question. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> who, um, who here suffers from, like, feeling impatient, wanting this to all happen faster? Okay, that's normal. Who yeah. here has killed someone just to watch him die? <laughs> <laughs> Only in our book. <laughs> Who here thinks that, um, you know, b beyond the normal impatience that we feel as humans and as artists and as business people who want to see our work being successful, who feels like th the actual industry is impatient to the point of it being like an epidemic, like an actual bad thing? Yeah, and I think it's hurting all of us. I think it, it, everybody would just, Hello? I think if everybody would chill the fuck out, we wouldn't have a problem because we wouldn't have to deal with the churn. We wouldn't have to deal with, you know, artists who are putting out a, you know, book every day or whatever. Like it's ridiculous how much, you know, some of the language that you hear in this industry now, people are feeling behind because they put out four books a year. <laughs> and that's crazy. Like that's crazy that you could put out four books a year and feel like you're failing. Um, and actually are failing because you're not getting sales. So just awesome on, on doing the work and playing the long game. I think anybody who plays the long game and, and puts artistry and craft and relationships over algorithms is, is going to be here five years from now. Right. And I will tell you this, that I have readers, and I know this, I have the read, some readers that they're the readers that buy three or only three or four books a year. But my book is one of those three or four books, and they'll wait for my book. I, I've lost very few readers on my email list. It was a year, y'all. It was a year between books, and some of that's because I wrote a bad book and got 50,000 words into it and had to throw it out and start all over. But I was does that with every book. Yeah, I wasn't, every willing book. To, I wasn't willing to put out something that wasn't as good as the books before, at least as good as the books before. But anyway, the whole point is that, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I can't write that way, and so I've had to figure out into it, a way around the rapid release to keep the algorithms on my side, and I have to spend money to do it, but I don't spend more than I have. So. Well, thanks so much for coming up, Jamie. Really appreciate it. So 
we actually we, we just finished um, we we just had Stone Table this weekend, and one of the things that I can share um, is that is that uh, we've been thinking a lot, and I think this is probably true of a lot of you too, which is why I think I can I can pretty safely say this is because the the market is so impatient. I think that there's there is this growing perception that we need to race to keep up with it, and well, of course, if we don't race to keep up with it, then we're going to be left behind, but. I think what Smarter Artist has always stood for, and I think that this is fitting at the final Smarter Artist, is let's be smarter, right? So what can we do to not just blindly chase this runaway, like it, it's like a race to the bottom, only it's a race to as fast as possible or something. It's it, it, Quality suffers in the name of, well, I just got to get something out. Um, people who take their time and like craft a book or, well, I don't even have a chance. This is the sort of sentiment that we're seeing. So... What I want the next few days to be about and what I, I would encourage anybody in this audience to think about as we go forward into, into 2019 and beyond is how can, we, how can we be smarter? How can we find tactics that don't make us compromise our artistic integrity or just our business sense and do something that feels stupid in the long term because it seems short term like the only thing that we can do? And so that's increasingly what I think we're, we're trying to, to figure out. Yeah, and I also think it's worth listening to your gut more because it's really easy to listen to all the noise. And if you listen to the noise in the industry, it's, which is really loud, it's all about how everything's broken or how you have to you know, go really, really fast. And that's not true. It's just short-term thinking. And I, I, I love actually, then that was totally not scripted. Thank you, Jamie, for coming up and mm -hmm. saying that because, I mean, a year between books still made it to six-figure author, right? Like that's, you do not hear that story because those people are not loud. The people who are loud are the people who are putting books out really fast and making lots of money and crowing about it or bitching about it. You don't really hear these people who are just keeping their nose down, doing the work, and then doing it again. And there is a model for that. It's just becoming a better craftsperson. It's becoming a smarter business person. It's being slow and methodical but consistent consistency is the best thing ever. It's compound interest. If you keep paying over and over and over with your efforts and you keep getting better, it's impossible that you won't have results after a time. But, you know, you see these people, they, they, they know how to ride the algorithms, but they're up and, and then they're down. And you see people who, um, you know, there are people in this room who have done an amazing job about building a little library of IP and then monetizing their backlist in an amazing way. And that's way better than turning to, like, how fast can I turn out some new crap to get into the, to the market? Like, that's, that's just not a smart play. I want to know how Dave feels about all of this. Oh, I was tuned out half of it. <laughs> we oh, are. I agree completely. I'm, I'm sure I'll mention this again tomorrow because it feels very, I don't know, cosmically right or something. Um, as you guys know, because we've said it over and over again, we are moving, we're sh shuttering a lot of the education that we're doing, or basically all of it other than the podcast. And, and books. Moving, we'll write books for you guys. Right, we'll write books. We have a bunch, like seven this seven year or something like that. Books, so yeah. that's kind of happening. But but basically turning entirely towards fiction. And we're going to be releasing a, a book a week because we are a company with a bunch of storytellers in it in um, one world. And that starts on Tuesday. So the last day of the final Smarter Artist Summit is the first day of what we should have been kind of doing all along. We took our, ball, our eye off the ball entirely. We could have kept doing both, um, but we couldn't. We couldn't, we couldn't manage both, and, and so we turned away from one thing into the other. And so this is, pay attention, Dave, because this is what I want to actually see, so you can pay attention, um, is what, that's, what that feels like to, to really, I don't know, I'll keep saying it again, like we're, we're going pro, we're treating it again more seriously. We're like, this is, for us, that means a book a week in a shared universe because we have the team and we have the rooms and stuff. But for somebody else, it might mean something different. It might mean slower releases or or faster releases, depending on who you are. It might mean more of attention to craftsmanship. It might mean I really want to pay attention to audio, which we're hearing a lot. Um, but how does this feel? I just heard an uh huh out there. Uh huh. Yeah. That's right. It's probably Kelly from Find a Way. I'm thinking. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so so that's what I was asking you about. If you caught up now, how does that feel? It, it feels great. Um, I think. For, I mean, all I've ever wanted to do is tell stories. And I think focusing strictly on that is, you know, more aligned with me. 
I never felt comfortable up here or on a stage or anything like that. So, yeah, it was actually kind of funny because it it once we realized that this is the right thing to do. Was it May of last? Does that sound right? Uh, since I don't know what you're talking about, yeah. Okay, so May, <laughs> in May of last year, when we decided, okay, officially, we really need to, to shatter the smarter artist and just lean full into story. Um, that was obviously the right decision for us, but it was a hard decision for us. And so when Johnny and I finally, you know, we arrived at this conclusion, and then we told Dave, and he was just like, thank, fucking thanks, <laughs> like, like, yeah, like muttering curses, but the good kind. Like, he was really, really happy. And there was never any, I mean, he loves this community and what it's done, and and he he does enjoy the podcast in his weird Dave way. Sometimes. Right. <laughs> but... <laughs> But it's it, it was always a distraction for him. It was never anything where, you know, Johnny and I have a different world perspective and we want to build slightly different things. And so even though this changed over time, it was always a more exciting thing for us than for Dave. And for Dave, the return to pure story is just where he always wanted to be. But I think that this... Com these coming years, and it, it is a little ironic that, that the smarter artist is shutting down, because I think that these are the years of the smarter artist. <laughs> like, I think that these are the oh, years... Way to pour salt in the wound. No, no, no. <laughs> no. What I mean is, this is everything... You know, like, so it, in the beginning of the karate movie, the guy trains, and then there's this moment of glory. Like, that's kind of this. Like, everybody's... We've all been, we've all been training. We've all been, um, you know, looking at, at, at longer-term thinking strategy instead of short-term tactics that might be damaging in the long term. And now is the time when I think it's going to really matter. I think this is where we separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, I think we've been predicting for a while, I think that in some way, shape, or form, there's some big changes coming in the marketplace in the next few years. It just it feels like a house of cards. If you've heard Sean mention the Google Panda update comparison a few times where the SEO game changed and suddenly it wasn't about keyword stuffing and, and just artificially trying to rank for things in Google. It was suddenly about, well, who can actually do it best? And that happened overnight. And that's the thing that we all need to realize is that when this change happens and it has to come, I don't see a scenario where it doesn't come at some point. And there were a lot of people who, who really banked their entire businesses on search engine results, right? And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, uh, Kathy up here, we were in a room together and we know somebody who lost everything. I mean, everything had a really, really successful, I think, million a month, more than a million a month. No, but it was well over a million a year. It was uh, a couple million a year. And, and just overnight, Google updates their algorithm, search no longer works. 90% of those businesses were just like, <laughs> nothing. And that's what's going to happen with Amazon. It's what's going to happen with discoverability. It's it, because what what's out there right now doesn't work. And we can all be annoyed with Amazon. I mean, raise your hand if you're annoyed with Amazon. I yeah. see you Kobo and drafted digital back there. <laughs> so, you know, like that's, it's not sustainable because Amazon actually doesn't want that. We can all be annoyed with them, but that's actually not in their best interest either. If people don't trust their recommendations, they're not buying books. And if they're not buying books, they're not buying TVs. And that's really what they want to sell, right? So, I, I mean, are we to worst show ever yet, basically? Um, I just want to close wrap this up by saying, um, so uh, I'll repeat this tomorrow because this is something I really kind of wanted to make a point and Damon to really told me to do it. Now, you don't want to be on Damon's bad side. Uh, <laughs> so Damon, well, actually, da you don't get to stand up because you're not an alternative to Amazon. Um, <laughs> Chrissy, can you stand up from, from Kobo? And are the draft to digital? They aren't. They aren't coming until later. Kevin and Dan, I think, are coming until later. Damon, go ahead and stand up. He can stand up anyway, because <laughs> why not? He likes the spotlight. <laughs> so, these guys and the draft to digital people and and um, Farrell, do you want to? I mean, again, it's like your your industry. You're not. But but these are the people you want to talk to. That's why they're here. I mean, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. Find them and talk to them because the relationships are ultimately what's going to matter here. The story shop guys, too, I forget them because we work with them, but they're over there, they're important, too. It's the relationships that you make are what's going to make the difference. So what's going to replace algorithmic thinking? What's going to allow somebody to survive the collapse of the way that it is right now, which we feel in inevitably, I mean, it might not happen overnight, but it, it'll change for sure over a period of time. It's going to be who do you know, and not in a, like, nepotistic sort of way, or, but just like a... It, the world is ultimately about relationships. It's ultimately about who can I talk to, who can I, how can I outthink this thing? And you're going to outthink it because you've you've actually 
done something rather than build a house of cards for yourself. So I guess maybe that's a good way to close it is to talk to the talk to your fellow authors and talk to these people and get to know them and think outside of the the KU. <laughs> yeah, every good thing in our in our lives is relationship based. We're we're collaborative to the bone. Um, I mean, many of our collaborators are in this room, including just the community. The community has helped to collaborate to make our business what it is. Um, but a, a lot of you collaborate with us in a more direct way and help us to tell better stories and help us to dream better dreams. And I think that that is the future. It is collaboration. You get away from the algorithms, get back into relationships. Think about your relationships with your readers as exactly that. They are relationships. Your relationships with your cover designers, with your editors, anyone who helps you bring your art to market. It's a relationship, and the better you treat that relationship, the, the more fruit it's ultimately going to bear. So thanks for being here, guys. I guess that'll conclude our live story studio podcast. I guess we'll just take a few minutes and then do the worst show ever, which Dave's got some rants. He'll, he'll, he'll pull them out, even though he's a better Dave now. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.